is my honor to introduce um, Jeff O. I actually, I was going to, uh, feeling rather honored to introduce a district governor, but also now I get to introduce Jeff O. Jeff is the uh, assistant district governor for area three. Jeff is a member of the Edina Club. And so Jeff is going to introduce our district governor. So welcome. It's always a pleasure to be here with my friends at Bloomington Noon. I've gotten to know a lot of you over the years and uh, you have a great club. Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce our district governor, Bob Halligan, who's been a member of the Buffalo Rotary Club since 2000 and served as their president in 2009, 2010. Uh, he served the district in a number of capacities, including legal counsel from 2011 to 14, area 13 assistant governor from 2010 to 13, and the Rotary Foundation fundraising chair for the district from 2013 to 2016. His Rotary journey has taken him, among other places, on numerous service trips to Guatemala, where his club, along with other clubs from our district, have authored or participated in over $400,000 in Rotary grants, including grants promoting economic development, nutrition, and maternal health for indigenous women. As you know, being district governor is a big job. You had one of our best district governors in Diane Kirby, and this is Bob's 60th of 61 club visits, and so he, he sees the finish line here uh, shortly. Uh, in his non-rotary life, uh, Bob is an attorney who began practice at the largest law firm in, in the Minnesota, and is now the owner of the smallest law firm in Minnesota, with just he as the employee. His legal practice focuses on small businesses, and he believes the proper role of an attorney is to help owners make their best business decisions in an ethical, practical, and profitable manner. He also serves as a mediator and an arbitrator. Please give a warm rotary welcome to our district governor, Bob Halligan. How's everybody today? Wonderful. It's nice to be back. And, and your lo lovely club, I've been here several times. I'm um, usually paying off bets yeah. to Mr. <laughs> Lucas because we have a bet every year between Buffalo and Bloomington in terms of contributions to the foundation. And, you know, you guys have eked it out past us the last few years, but we'll try it again this year. I like to start my presentation out by asking a question. And the question is, Jim Lucas, why are you a Rotarian? I'm asking. 37 years, uh, it's a big question. And I think it's because I wanted to be part of a leadership group in the community of Bloomington. I was invited to join this leadership group, and it's proven to be everything I ever wanted to be part of. Mary Kurth, why are you a Rotarian? I want to serve humanity, and Rotary is a fabulous way to do that especially on the global side. So I like to tell people why I'm a Rotarian, see if I can find a spot where this works, um, and why I was willing to give a year of my life to Rotary. Um, being district governor is a tremendous honor. It, it, it truly is. And you have the ability uh, to see so many things about our district, but it requires a commitment. And Many of you have, have heard my story before, but I'm, I'll, I'll shorten it up for you a little bit. My Rotary story begins with my mother. Uh, I'm the son of an immigrant. I'm a first generation American. My mother grew up in, the, in Czechoslovakia on a small dirt floor farm home. Um, no running water, no electricity. She immigrated to this country in 1938 just as the Nazis were invading the Sudetenland. And when she came to this country, she didn't speak any English, and she had very little formal education. And so you can imagine a young girl of 13 coming to this country in the middle of the Great Depression, a world war beginning to rage, wondering what it is the life was going to hold for her in this strange new place, this country that's so different from where she grew up. And my mother lived the life of an immigrant. And the life of an immigrant is a difficult life. It's a hard life. At 13, she came to this country. She spoke no English. She was put into kindergarten. And she sat in the little tables and chairs with the boys and girls who made fun of her because of the way she dressed and the way she spoke. 
At the age of 16, she dropped out of school because school just didn't work for her. But she was a hard-working farm girl. She went to work in the factories and the mills of New England. She married another Slovak, had three sons, and then at the age of, of 38, was widowed. And she was a single mother in this country before that term existed. No education, limited job skills, no community that she belonged to. But my mother is a hard-working woman. And so she went to work in the factories and the mills of New England. And she believed not only in hard work, but she believed in service. And, and the gentleman who gave your invocation today spoke it so well. She was a Rotarian at heart. She believed in serving others without expecting anything re in return. She believed in serving others because she knew that is how our lives get richer. So for me, as, as uh, I'm the beneficiary of that immigrant's life. I'm a first generation American. I'm the first one to go to college in my family. I've had success in the businesses that I own. I, at least as I define it, I have a professional degree. And I benefited from that immigrant's life, most of all because of what she taught me about service. What she taught me about the obligation we all have to give to others, to give to those who are less fortunate than us, to give in recognition of all that we have received and all of the benefits we have in this, in this special land in which we live. And so I'm an all-in Rotarian. That's my Rotary story. That's why I'm willing to be up here today. And as I began this year as district governor, I thought, what is it that I have to say to Rotarians about what my vision is? Well, for me, Rotary took me around the world. It took me at first to Guatemala, where I began to work with the indigenous women of Guatemala, where I met the great Maria Pacheco, a woman who spent her entire life working in rural communities, giving to women who were just like my mother in many ways, women with very little education. They dress kind of funny. They speak a different language. They have nothing in their lives in terms of respect because they're women in their communities. And in their communities, women are seen as having little value until they begin to earn an income. And what Rotary has been able to bring to them through the Wakami organization, through the grants that you've participated in, is the ability to generate income in their lives, the ability to earn money and it changes everything for them. Because when women earn money in rural communities, they invest it in their families. When women earn money in their families, suddenly they're seen differently by their husbands and by their communities. And they become the kind of leaders that we all are in this room. Because the women in these communities are just like us. They're they believe in service. They believe in giving back. And so for me, Rotary brought me full circle. It brought me to the place of being able to serve women who are just like my mother. And more than being able to just serve them, it, it, it showed me again the, the incredible benefits of service. Because whatever I've been able to do in these communities and whatever resources we've brought to them, I've received so much more back than I could ever give to them. Service is the special sauce of life. It's the secret ingredient that makes us all better, that makes our lives richer. So again, for me, as I took on this role, I thought, what is it? What is Rotary's place in the world, and, and how do we express it? And in the spring, I was in Atlanta for the Rotary International Convention. And Atlanta's got a tremendous history of, of civil rights. Um, it, is, it is at the heart of our civil rights uh, uh, struggles in the 60s and 70s. There's a civil rights museum in Atlanta. And if you go to that museum, one of the first things you see is a display on the segregationists. So you see a set of black and white television clips of men like George Wallace and Strom Thurmond and Lester Maddox and Bull Connor. And they speak with so much ferocity, so much intensity. 
In support of a system intended to keep little black boys and girls from going to school with little white boys and girls. And what was striking to me as I saw that display was how familiar those voices sounded. And not just familiar to the Nazis and the KKK in Charlottesville, but familiar and similar to what we hear in the media every day, it seems, these days. Voices from the left and the right that focus on what makes us different. Voices from, from all sides of the spectrum that focus on their individual grievances, that focus on the, their personal concerns and protecting their own. But when I was in Atlanta, I also had the great benefit of, of listening to a couple of tremendous speakers, one of whom uh, was the daughter of Martin Luther King. And, and Dr. King spoke to us using the word interconnectedness. So to this mostly wide audience, Dr. Martin Luther King's daughter, probably the person most entitled in Atlanta to focus on her own grievances, to focus on what, what was wronged, what her wrongs, what had been done to her. And her father had been slain on a balcony in Memphis, Tennessee for preaching peace. But instead of talking to us about her grievances, she talked to us about interconnectedness. And she said that what matters the most is when we recognize what brings us all together, that what matters the most is the connections between us, and how by, prom by promoting and focusing on those connections, we can move forward, all of us, together, not, one, not each of us one at a time. And she was followed the next day by the great Andrew Young. And Andrew Young is a great civil rights warrior, mayor of Atlanta, ambassador to the United Nations. And Dr. Young knew Rotarians, and he spoke to Rotarians. And he said, the great thing about Rotary is Rotarians don't focus on the noise in the air about why we're different. What Rotarians do is we see a problem, and we fix a problem. We stand together, Democrats, Republicans, Christians, Jews, Muslims, and atheists. We see a problem, we fix a problem. That's what makes Rotary the greatest service organization in the world. How does Rotary do it? You guys have the special sauce here. I'm not gonna, I don't need to spend a lot of time talking to you about the things of Rotary. You are leaders in our district in terms of the foundation. Diane, uh, many years ago, was responsible for starting a system of raising Rotary fo uh, Foundation giving that we now apply across our district. In our district, we expect every Rotarian to give to the Rotary Foundation. We ask every Rotarian to give at least $365 a year. Four years ago, when I was the fundraising chair in the district, we set a goal of, of reaching 300 Paul Harris Society members in our district. Paul Harris Society members are people who give $1,000 a year to the, Paul, to the foundation. When I started, we had 115 members. Today, we sit at 292 members of the Paul Harris Society. I need eight more in case some of you have just been waiting to join the Paul Harris Society because we will get to 300 this year. One of the things I'm asking every Rotarian to do this year is just dig a little bit deeper. Give an extra 50 bucks more than you gave last year. If you gave 100 bucks last year, give 150 bucks this year. If you gave $1,000 last year, give $1,050 this year. And if we reach 300 Paul Harris Society members, and everybody gives an extra 50 bucks, we will be at a million dollars in giving this year. And that means that we will have in our district $500,000 a year to spend on our local and international projects. And the other 500,000 will sit out at Rotary International waiting for us with matching grants and international projects. If you don't know this, and you should know this, you are a part of one of the greatest Rotary districts in the world. District 5950 every year is one of the leaders in giving to the foundation. 
we are one of the greatest districts in all the Rotary world. And there are 1.2 million members. There's about 33,000 clubs. The clubs are organized into 550 districts. Your district sits at the very top of the districts in the world. We are regularly in the top 10 in giving. We are regularly one of the leaders in the work that we do. And as Diane and the other ex-district governors know, when you get to see and look at the Rotary world from this perch, you realize how amazing our district is and how much we do and how, how just how tremendous our clubs and our Rotarians are here. So the foundation is the key to everything we do. What many people, almost everybody has heard about as well as the Rotary uh, uh, battle against polio, excuse me, the end polio campaign. When we were in Atlanta, we were excited because in May in Atlanta in 2017, there had only been five cases of polio in the world. Now, 30 years ago when we began, there were 350,000 cases of polio annually. And this year, as of May, there had been five in the world. And we were thinking maybe, maybe this is the year that we would go from here, from being this close to here, where we would never again see a case of polio in the world. Unfortunately, what man makes, man can break. And in the war-torn area of Syria, there was an outbreak of vaccine-induced polio. The fight goes on, but it does go on. And in Atlanta, Bill Gates, recognizing the power of Rotary, pledged to match Rotary two for one, up to $100 million a year for the next three years. So between the Gates Foundation and the Rotary Foundation, over the next three years, we will commit almost a half a billion dollars to finally end polio in the world. And that's the one applause line that, that deserves some applause. Right? We have some new challenges. This is your Rotary International President, Ian Risley. He's an affable Aussie. You can see he's got great taste in ties. Um, he's given us a few challenges this year um, that I've talked to your board about. One of the things we're doing this year that's different is we're trying to track hours and dollars in all of the clubs in our district. We do a great job of telling our international story. We don't do as good a job of telling our local story. And so we're asking all the clubs to tell us what you're contributing to your communities in terms of hours of volunteer service and dollars in your communities to help us tell our local story better. Uh, challenged us to plant 1.2 million trees this year. Um, this is another great example of how we are one of the greatest districts in the world. You guys have already planted your 77 trees earlier this spring. The district decided that what we needed to do is we needed, the challenge to us was to plant 2,700 trees. And we thought that was, that was kind of a puny challenge. So we created a partnership with the Nature Conservancy and we got the Nature Conservancy to kick in $10,000. Between the clubs and the district, we're gonna raise another $15,000. And we're gonna plant 25,000 trees in a, a, for, our, for our district this year. There's no other district in the world that is even remotely close to what we're doing in this area. And it's a, it's a testament to the creativity of our district. One of the things I talk about for, at every club is the issue of membership. And before I get into talking about where membership needs to go, I always like to thank the old white guys like Lucas. Because the old white guys are the ones who, who built this organization. Uh -huh. And I could say that because I'm an old white guy. <laughs> and the old white guys built the greatest service organization in the world. It was founded on principles 100 years, 100 years ago that are universal and that have carried us forward. But I, I think we all know that it's not enough anymore and that our demographic need to change in a couple of ways. And one of the things we're doing this year is really focusing on female membership. And I like to talk about two reasons why we focus on female membership. And the first reason is the moral reason. We have gender-based issues in our country. You see them play out in the media uh, on a regular basis. They're they in front of us this year 
with, a special, with especially strong force. But we should never forget that we live in a world where female slavery still exists. We live in a world where, in some places, girls can't go to school without the threat of having acid thrown in their face. We live in a world where girls six, seven, and eight years old are sold into an institution some people call marriage that's nothing more than female slavery. And so we have an obligation, the Rotarians of this country, this place, this time, to stand for the principle of gender equality. There are still places in the Rotary world where women aren't welcome. And we have a moral obligation, an ethical obligation, to stand for the principle of equality between the genders. And that's the first reason why we do it. The second reason is a more selfish reason. We need members. We all know that. We all need, know we need members. And so we want to bring more females into Rotary. Because as great as we are as a district, and we are a great district, we're still 70% male. So when I talk about bringing ro women into Rotary, I'm not talking to the women in the room. I'm talking to the men in the room. It's the obligation of the men in Rotary to stand for the principle that your club, that this location and that our district is going to be a place that not only invites women in, but engages them in the things that matter to them. And in our district, the district leadership uh, following me my year and for the next three years have committed to the principle of reaching 50.3% women in Rotary in our district. Why 50.3%? Because that's the percentage of women in Minnesota. We don't see any reason why our percentages should be any different in Rotary. And if we achieve that goal, that would mean adding 1,000 new women to our Rotary district, which is a fairly stunning number. But you know, Rotarians are used to doing amazing things. I mean, we're on the verge of eliminating polio as a disease. In our district, to get to 50%, what we're asking every club to do is a fairly simple thing. For the next three years, add five new women to your club, that's all. If every club focuses and is intentional about adding women, and is intentional about adding five new female leaders, five new female servant leaders, by the time we're, at, we're there, in three or four years, we'll be at 50%, and our clubs will be different. Our district will be different. We will be more dynamic and better as a club, as a district. It's not enough to just invite women, though. It's not enough. If we are going to, in fact, change the demographic, not just with women, but with millennials, with minorities, with people of different persuasions. We need to be at the table for the issues that matter to those populations. So one of the things that, that, I'm, that, that I'm highlighting at every club are projects that are happening in the district that, that I know you all are already familiar with. The first is the issue of opioid abuse. Everybody sees that regularly uh, in the news. Um, I'm not sure whether you guys have had an opioid speaker here yet or not. You should. You have, all right. Opioid abuse exists in every single community. It touches almost every single family. And if you want to open your doors to different populations, this is the type of issue to be at the table for. In February, we're going to have a summit on opioid abuse that's sponsored by the district. We're bringing providers from around the state with the goal of creating a set of ideas and resources that community by community will allow Rotary Clubs to deal with the issue of opioid abuse. The Steve Rumler Hope Foundation, Lexi Reed Holtum is the, is the leader of that. If you haven't had her, you should have her. If not, think about engaging on that issue as the type of issue that, that will put you at the table for women and millennials and different populations. The second issue I like to highlight is human trafficking. Human trafficking obviously has been, been in front of us with the, with the Super Bowl lately, but it doesn't end with the Super Bowl. It exists every single day in our communities. 
And every single community has potential victims of human trafficking. It's the vulnerable boys and girls of your community who are the targets of human trafficking. It's the vulnerable boys and girls who are displaced and, and wondering how to find their way that are the targets for traffickers. And again, it's an example of the type of issue that, that you should consider being involved in if you want to be at the table for populations that might be different than who you have in your club already. The, um, the human tra I'm sorry, the Human Trafficking Summit, it's the Summit on Human Trafficking, not Opioid Abuse, that's happening in February. Karen Walkowski is a great speaker on this topic. If you want to learn more about this topic, if you haven't had a, a speaker on it, you should bring her in. She's great. And those are just two examples of things that you need to think about being at the table for. St. Cloud's doing an amazing youth homelessness project. Little St. James is holding an intercultural event that's bringing to together diverse communities. We need to think outside the box of what we do and how we reach the people we want to be a part of our clubs. I want to leave you with a thought about Talking Rotarian. Um, some people say you should have that 30 second snappy elevator speech that magically turns someone into a Rotarian. That's never really worked for me because I'm a lawyer, I can't say anything in 30 seconds. <laughs> I think if you're going to talk to somebody about Rotary, you have to talk to them at the level of their heart and their soul. You have to talk to them in a way that touches them. When people talk about politics, and they talk about how one party does this and another party does that, talk about what we do. Talk about how Rotarians, we see a problem, we fix a problem, we stand together. Democrats, Republicans, independents, political agnostics. We see a problem, we fix a problem, that's what we do. That's the politics of Rotary. When people talk about religion and they talk about how one faith believes this and another faith does that, talk about the children we save. Talk about how we believe at our core in service, in giving without expectation of getting anything in return. How we believe in our heart that it is through service and giving that we are made so much richer, so much better, and so much stronger as human beings. And when people talk about how angry the world always seems and how everybody seems to be yelling at each other all the time, talk about what it's like to walk into a room full of Rotarians and know every single one of them is a potential friend in service. How you can go to a Rotary District Conference and see 500 people and know every single one of them is a potential friend that could change your life by the work you do together. How you can go to one of any 33,000 clubs in the world and be welcomed as a brother and sister in Rotary. I want to thank you for listening to me today. It truly is my honor to be your district governor. It is a humbling experience. My job, as I see it, is to be your servant this year. Um, I always ask clubs to invite me in. I, to the extent I can be a part of the life of your club, that's what I'm supposed to be doing, and that's what I would love to do. So thank you for your service. Thank you for being Rotarians, and thank you for all you do to make the world a better place. Thanks. focus on, you know, it, and it's interesting because it, it tends to be women who push back most on the concept about focusing on female membership. And I get that. And, and this isn't, you know, an affirmative action. Project. This is, in my mind, it's an obligation to the men of Rotary. I mean, I, I think we need to establish that culture. So, and, and from a sales perspective, a membership perspective, every single community has female leaders who have not been asked to join Rotary yet. So every man in this room 
could identify two or three or four women in their lives who are female leaders who belong to be here. And so I'm asking for that kind of outreach. In terms of other areas, um, the, uh, there's a couple of things going on. Uh, one of the things that, that we're looking at is how to develop a, different kinds of membership. So looking at corporate memberships in, in creative ways that allows a corporation to, a, to join to a, and have a, have a number of people participate in the meals. But I think we need to look at that a little different and make sure that everybody's coming is actually a Rotarian and actually signs up to be a Rotarian. Uh, Steve Solbrecht is looking at the concept of establishing a, kind of a theme-based club, looking at the issue of ecology as a theme. And there's other themes we can, we can, we can look at to see, see what that does. And, and we had a good discussion at my table. There's some shortcomings to that approach. There's some issues. But, but see what that does for membership. And then I think next year what you'll see is a launch of the community core concept, which is a concept that's been used in, in many other places around the world to create a kind of a feeder system for Rotarians by identifying people who are interested in being engaged in the activities that we're engaged in. Alex. Uh, this is a question for Deb or Sherry or recent leadership about what our numbers are right now. I heard you're about 35%. Yeah, about okay. well, 35%. Okay. So you're a little bit above average in the district? Not bad. I want to exclude uh, mm -hmm. members that fit our club regardless of who they are. And so if we stayed at 35% and had 15 new members, that would still be a success at first. And I'm concerned that. And, you know, it's, and it's not, you know, I mean, if you had 15, 15 new female members, the odds are you're going to probably be adding six or seven or eight or ten male members. That's okay, you know. I mean, we're not, it isn't that kind of a goal. We're sure not excluding male members. But really, again, I, it's a challenge to the men of Rotary. I mean, think about the women in your lives. Think about the female leaders you know. And I guarantee if you sit down and think in those terms, be intentional about it, you will, you will think of female leaders, servant leaders, who belong here. That's what we're really asking is be intentional to think about the women in your community who belong to be here. If and when polio finally is gone, what is Rotary International thinking of as its next project? They won't talk about it until, Rotary, until polio is done. They don't want to jump ahead. I mean, I think the, the obvious potential choice is water. Um, but, you know, some people think it'll be other things. I, I, I have been um, concerned about population growth for a long time. When I was a baby, there were probably two billion people on this earth, and now they're what, seven billion? And by 2050, it's gonna be astronomically. I mean, I'll be gone by that time. Thank but. God. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'll tell you about, what, what I think is interesting about that is, is two years ago, human trafficking wasn't even on anybody's horizon. Nobody, it wasn't a rotary issue. But it got highlighted at the, at the International Convention, and you're see, seeing it explode around the Rotary world right now. And some people are suggesting that maybe human trafficking will be the next big Rotary issue. I don't know if that's the case or not, but whatever your issue is, if it's population growth, or it's human trafficking, or it's water, or it's any of those things, the way it becomes the next big deal in Rotary is by working at it. Is by, it starts here, it starts at every club. That's how it always starts with Rotary. So if that's what you want to present, that's what you need to do. Will there ever be a concerted effort to focus more on service and less on monetary giving? It seems like there's always a stress on give money, give money, give money, and yeah, if you got some time, uh, pick up your hand and hammer a nail. I think it's, I think it's always there. But I, I don't think we can ever forget that it's the money that allows us to do the stuff we want to do. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's both. I mean, that's the challenge. We don't, like my friend Mr. Lucas says, we don't want to become an organization of check writers. That's not what we want. We don't want people who just give money. We, we are a, a service organization that does things. And so I think we need to, in part, look at alternate forms of membership that anticipate some people can't give as much or spend as much on a regular basis for a meeting. 
and still figure out how to make them Rotarians, make them part of our fellowship, if you will. But at the same time, I'll tell you that we have the greatest charity in the world. I mean, the Rotary Foundation is the only charity in the world where you can give your money, spend it on your project and your community, and nobody's going to tell you what to do with it. I mean, it is truly the greatest. It is, one of, it is continually ranked as the best charity in the world. There's a few others that are tied with it. But it, it, it receives perfect rankings. And it is the engine that drives us. I don't think we can ever forget that, that it's those resources that allow us to do so much. In your presentation, did you use the word vaccine-induced polio? Yeah. What happened? The polio, you know, the, the, it used to, and the, live, the vaccine was a live, polio, a live polio virus. And so I don't really know the, the scientific details of what happened, but in Syria, in a, and I think it was in Aleppo where there was just a horrific, you know, horrific bombardments and, and uh, you know, tremendous discussion, uh, uh, tremendous destruction. It, somehow the polio vaccine was introduced into a water supply or somehow these seven, there were 17 children who were exposed to it inappropriately. So I, I don't really know much more than that. Polio's gone away from, or Rotary's gone away from the live polio virus now and they're using inoculations to kind of get us to the end of this fight. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I know. Yep. Can I address that? Yeah, absolutely. Sorry. This is what I do. <laughs> there you go. You should have just stood up and I wouldn't have. So um, in the past, when we were giving polio vaccine, we used to give little vials of live polio virus. So when a person took that, a baby took it, as they were building um, antibodies to it, they also were you know, here, pooping it out. And so it was getting out into the environment. Um, and so basically we saw some people would end up getting uh, polio virus from exposure to someone who had gotten the vaccine. So in the United States now, we don't give that live virus anymore, we give inactivated virus. And so basically now babies get shots. And so we're not, it, we're not sending that live virus out into the environment like we have been in the past. In areas where there's still endemic polio, they are still using that live virus because it gives a better response and a better um, protection to polio. And so that, so when they were giving that polio to those kids, it was getting out into the environment, it got into the water, and then therefore more people were exposed to it. And if your antibodies weren't up, they would have picked up the virus and potentially had polio. Um, that was close. Um, and thank you, Bob, again for coming and joining us on your 51st uh, presentation. 61st. Oh, 61st. 61st. Yeah. <laughs> and um, in honor of Rotary this year, um, for the speakers, we're dedicating our uh, tree planting to the, the speakers as well. So we um, appreciate what you've done and um, in honor of your presenting today, we uh, contributed money to the tree planting effort, which of course, I'm very proud that we probably were the first, I would guess, we, for sure in the district, we're probably the first ones to plant our trees. And also, we're participating uh, financially. Uh, Bob Erickson contributed financially on behalf of the club uh, to the 27,000 trees as well. So will be part of both of those.